and we're going to continue looking at a very important uh, letter that was written by the Apostle John, and um, it's called 1 John. And uh, we're, last week we looked at the first four verses. This week we're going to look at, hopefully, uh, the next six verses. But I'm going to read the entire text from 1 to 10. So it's 1 John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Now, just by way of summary from what we we studied last week, let's just look at a few things. He's talking about first the eternality of the Son of God. That although Jesus was born 2,000 years ago, it is called an incarnation, God coming in the flesh. So Jesus of Nazareth, as a man, had his beginning 2,000 years ago, but he is the eternal Son of God, one of the three persons of the Trinity. Now, some of the most important truths in this text are this. John keeps saying, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands. And then he goes on and he says again in verse 3 or verse 2, And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you. And then verse 3, what we have seen and heard. You see, he keeps repeating himself. Why? If you look at all the religions in the world, they're primarily this. Some person separated themselves from their own culture, their own people. Maybe they went into a cave. Maybe they went out into the wilderness. And they drew up ideas from their own heart, from their own mind, of what it means to be alive. Or they make tremendous claims of having received a vision or a dream or some sort of kind of esoteric communication from somewhere other than the natural. Christianity is saying no. John is saying no. We didn't see a vision or just have a dream or think up something, but that God entered into our world. We saw him. Not only did we see him, he says we contemplated him. We watched him carefully. And not only that, we touched him. He was real. He was a real man. And the claim of Christianity is that 2,000 years ago, God became flesh. He did not leave aside his deity. He did not cease to be deity, but he took upon himself our humanity. Now, why? Why did he do this? Very important question. There are a couple of reasons, and I will give you just two of them. Number one, revelation. To make God known to man. God is always condescending. That means he is coming down to our level to speak with us. But the primary reason why God became man is because of man's problem. The Bible speaks about Adam as the first man and the fall of Adam and subsequently the fall of all of humanity in Adam. And since then, humanity is born with a twofold problem. One is its relationship with God is broken because of sin. It's a problem of justice, of righteousness. And two, the power of sin. We can see it in children. We can see it in young people. We can see it in history. We can see it when we look in the mirror. That we do things that we know we ought not do. And the great question is this. If God is just, and He is, If he's righteous, and he is, if he's holy, if he hates evil, then the big question is, what does God do with people like us? What does he do? If he simply forgives, he's not just. 
if he simply looks over our sin, he's not holy. So the great question is, how can a truly righteous God, who will always punish evil, how does he forgive and maintain his justice? And the answer to that is found in the person of Jesus Christ. What happens is this, God becomes a man, he lives the life we could not live, and then he goes to Calvary and he dies, he suffers and dies vicariously. Now the word vicarious, if you don't remember anything else from what I've said, remember that word. Vicarious means in the place of another, a substitute. You did not live, I did not live a righteous life before God. Christ came and lived a righteous life before God, perfectly righteous life. That's why several times in the New Testament we hear God speaking from heaven, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But then on Calvary, at the cross, what happened was he bore the sin of humanity. He bore your sin. He bore the guilt of it. And all the righteous anger of a holy God that should fall upon us for all our crimes, not only against God, but against humanity, fell upon him. Do you remember right before he died, he said, it is finished. What he, that term actually means paid in full. So that everything that we owed to the justice of God because of our crimes against one another, against him, he paid. And Paul says in Romans chapter 3, now God has proven himself to be just and the justifier of the one who believes in Christ. Okay? So let me tell, you, tell it to you this way. I've used this illustration many times. Let's look at it this way. Someone commits a crime against you or your family. Let's say even something is atro an atrocity, a, a murder. Murders your mom, your brother, your sister. And they're caught by the police and they go to court. And the judge looks down, as you're in the courtroom, looks down at the person who murdered your family and says this. I am a loving and compassionate judge, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. I forgive you. And then he walks out with his arm around the murderer and their best friends. What would you say? You'd say, what? That's not just. That's evil. That judge is as corrupt as the criminals that he pardons. So that's the great question. How can God pardon you and pardon me? Just look over our sin. He can't. But what he did was he took our place and died under the judgment that we deserve. So Paul says in the great argument in Romans 3, now God has proven himself just because he's punished sin, but he's able to declare us right with him through Jesus Christ because he punished sin in his own son. So that's the great reason for the incarnation. Revelation through Jesus Christ, we see who God really is but also, and most importantly, atonement and at one of bringing God and man together by removing sin through standing in our place. Now, um, another thing that, that, that John says here that, is, that I really want to point out to you college students, he says this in verse 3, he says, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. John is saying, we're giving you this message that through believing it, you will have fellowship with us and with God. Now, John is making a really radical statement. He's saying, if you don't have fellowship with us, it'd be difficult to say you have fellowship with God. Okay. Now, how could John say something like that? Because that's kind of a scary statement. You see, John was an apostle. One of the men that was set aside by Christ. One of the men who was moved, empowered, inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak forth the truth of the gospel, to write the New Testament. Okay. So what he's saying is, if you believe what we're saying, 
If you agree with us, you have fellowship with God. Basically, if you believe what we've written as scripture, you have fellowship with God. Now, John can say that as an apostle. I can't say that. My church can't say that. As a matter of fact, nobody's can. And the point I'm trying to make is, especially on college campuses, be very, very careful. If someone comes to you preaching, you need Christ. You need Christ. Well, that's a wonderful thing. That's true. But if they also say this, and you have to be in your gr our group, or you don't have Christ, that's starting to get scary. Do you see what I'm saying? And I want you to see that. We're here, I'm here, not because you need me. Not because you need the church I belong to, but to tell you that you need Christ. See, if you need Christ plus me, then I have power over you, don't I? If you need Christ plus my church, then we have power over you, don't we? But if I stand before you and say you need Christ, and you need to look in Scripture, and you need to deal with His claims, the claims He makes about Himself, then I really don't have any power over you. Even when I'm teaching you, I've, I've studied quite a bit. I've gone to school. I've, I hope I'm a sincere man, and I hope whoever teaches here is a sincere man. But, but always, you know, even when the Apostle Paul taught, he said that the Bereans were noble because they, they, they examined the Scriptures. And, and that's the same thing you should do. Anytime someone starts talking about Christ or salvation, you need to look for yourself. I remember I was on a college campus several years ago, and I mean, it was basically a riot. I couldn't believe what was going on. And people were saying all kinds of nonsense. I mean, illogical, irrational nonsense. And this one person shouted out these Things that just were completely and totally historically inaccurate. And so I, my wife looked at me and she said, you need to do something about this. So she, I said, okay. So I got in front of the crowd. And when that person shouted that out again, I said one thing. I said, primary documents. And the whole crowd just stopped. It's like about, I don't know, 50, I don't know how many people were there. It was a bunch and they were mad. I just screamed out, primary documents. And the person goes, what? And I go, you just made a truth statement. You made a statement about what is true in history. What are your primary documents? I'm not talking about what professor did you read, what commentary did you read. What's your primary documents, your basic evidence for saying that? They didn't have any because there weren't any. All right. Well, in Christianity, this is the primary document. You see, and this is what you need to study. You need to seek out Christ. When when I was on campus, when I was a student years ago at the University of Texas, this guy who was telling me about Christ, you know, I just avoided, you know, I was throwing all these objections out. And, I'll never forget, I said, well, part of my family's Catholic and part of my family's Baptist and part of my family's this, and I don't want to have anything to do with religion. And he just stopped me. His face got really serious, and he said, you've mistaken our conversation. And I said, what do you mean? He said, did I mention religion? Did I mention any of that one time? And I said, no. He said, I've only mentioned this. Jesus of Nazareth. And you have to determine who is he. Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he exactly who he said he was? So forget about all the other stuff. And that's the same way I'm telling you. It, it's looking into the scriptures because that's, that's what ultimately led me to really see and, and become a Christian. It wasn't that somebody else told me but I started looking in the scriptures okay and that's what John's saying here he says we have fellowship with the father and the son we want you to have fellowship with the father but what he's talking about is far removed from from me or another teacher or preacher or church you need the Bible you need to look in the Bible you need to ask yourself this question who 
is Jesus of Nazareth, okay? Because he's what our faith is about. Remember, John didn't start off with, if you follow these rules, you're okay with God. He didn't start that way, did he? Christianity has rules. It has what we call an ethic and a morality. But you don't, you, you don't get a right relationship with God by carrying out some principles, wearing funny clothes or you know, not doing a whole bunch of fun things. Christianity. Let's say that there's a new Christian here. They became a Christian an hour ago. Okay? I've been a Christian for about 35 years or more. This person's been a Christian for a few hours and they've really not, you know, they haven't gone through jungles and suffered from threats and all sorts of things and done all kinds of works. They just became a Christian. Do you realize that person and I are going, to the, are going to heaven for the same reason? Jesus Christ died for sinners. 35 years adds nothing to my salvation. Salvation is a gift. That's a wonderful thing. That is an amazing thing. You see, the Apostle Paul who lived maybe into his 60s and ended up dying a martyr and suffered maybe like no one else has ever suffered for the cause of Christ, he went to heaven for the same reason the thief on the cross went to heaven. Jesus Christ died for sinners. So this first passage, what it's talking about primarily is it's all about a person who claimed to be God in the flesh. And I believe with all my heart and my life that he, he really was and is. Okay? Now, let's go on to five. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now, when John writes sometimes, and, and he does it so often that sometimes people think he does it on purpose. Like, we should uh, worship God in spirit and in truth. Spirit there can refer to our spirit, the depth of our being, or it can refer to the Holy Spirit. Truth can refer there to sincerity or actual propositional truth. Maybe something like that's going on. He says, this is the message we have heard from him, from Christ, and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Now there's two possibilities here. Maybe they just both blend together. And what are they? There was a group of teachers that eventually became known as Gnostics. Now Gnostics... Uh, come from the Greek uh, noun gnosis, which is knowledge. And, and what they basically claimed was salvation was found in this knowledge that they had. And it was a secret knowledge. That's why we call it esoteric. It was dark, okay? And only a few people really had it. And there's a real possibility that at least the roots of this group uh, were starting to influence here. They were saying, no, 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 you, you simpleton Christians who have this faith in what, you know, Jesus who died and rose again. That's true, but now there's this deeper knowledge that you've got to get from us. And if you don't get it from us who have these secrets, then you're not going to heaven. And, and I think what John is saying here is, no, 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 no. God is light. He's not dark. He's not secret. He's not hidden. He has shown us in the person of Christ. He has shown us who he is and he has shown us what he desires from us. OK, so it's not some secret knowledge you need that only a few, you know, inductees have. It's very plain. Also, this group was kind of they had two extremes. Some of these Gnostics, they were all about rules and regulations and they had all these different things. You, you couldn't eat and you couldn't do this and you couldn't do that. And if you did these things, you weren't right with God. So they had, there was one extreme that said that and there was another extreme in the same group that actually said, no, the body is, you know, God hates the material world. He hates the body. And so it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So you can just sin all day long and still be a Christian. So you had two extreme groups. One was saying, in order to be a 
to real be a follower of Jesus, you got to follow all these little technical rules and you can't eat and you can't do this and you can't do that and everything's bad. And he had this other group saying, the body's bad anyway, so let's just sin and have a good time. And John is saying, this is wrong. This is wrong. Christianity, we are not Christians because we're able to follow a set of rules about eating and drinking and all other sorts of things. We're Christians because we believe in what Christ has done for us. Yet at the same time, John's going to tell us, if we truly believe and our hearts have been changed, he says we are going to follow a Christian ethic. And that Christian ethic is primarily manifested. Well, Jesus summed it up pretty well, didn't he? In two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, there's a commandment in the law that says that I should not commit adultery. I'm married. I shouldn't commit adultery. That's a law, and I shouldn't do it. But even if that law wasn't there, if I really loved my wife, would I commit adultery? No. If I really loved my friend, would I lie to him, steal from him, cheat him? No. So you see... That's how we can say that although there is an ethic and there are rules in Christianity, that it's all summed up in this, to walk in love. If I love, am I going to be selfish? Greedy? Hot-tempered? Impatient? Proud? No, none of that, you see. And so what John is going to get at is this. If you've truly become a Christian, some things are going to change in your life. But he's really clear. You don't become a Christian because you changed things. And by changing things, you've earned salvation. He's saying he's going to tell us this. You're saved only by trusting in what God has done for you in his son. But if you've truly trusted in him, your life is going to begin to change. And that's the same thing Jesus said. You will know them by their fruit. Do you see? Their fruit. Now, let's go on. He says, This is the message that we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. Then He says, If we say we have fellowship with Him, if we say that we're Christians, okay? If we say that we have a relationship with God, we have fellowship with God, okay, and yet walk in darkness, then we're, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, let's look at it this way. He's saying this. God is light. God has told us who He is. He's righteous. He's holy. He's loving. He's compassionate. Do you see? God has told us this about Himself. God has also revealed to us His will. There are commands. There are principles of wisdom. But they're all summed up in this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, what He's saying is, if we claim to be Christians, and yet we walk, we live in a way that contradicts everything God has said about Himself, and contradicts everything God has said about His will and His commands, then we're lying when we say we're a Christian. Now, he uses a real strong word. He says you're lying. Okay? Now, it can be purposeful deception. It can be self-delusion. But you're lying. And that goes back to what Jesus said. Again, you will know them by their fruits. And that's a very, very important truth, a very important truth. Now, a person who truly becomes a Christian, they will begin to bear the fruit of a Christian. Does that mean that they become perfect the moment they're saved? No. Does that mean they attain perfection in this life? No. Does this mean they'll no longer sin? No, we'll struggle with sin. What it means is, there's not perfection, but there's a change of direction. 
And yes, sometimes it'll be two steps forward and three steps back. And sometimes it'll be two steps forward and one step back. It'll be a struggle all our life. But when you look at a person, you're going to be able to see this person is different. They're, they're loving God. They're loving people. They're trusting in the Son. Something has happened to them. Okay? Now, a lot of times people will say things like this, and it's well-meaning, but it's not well-stated. They'll say something like this, when God saved me, He changed me. That's true, but we need to look at something. When God saves a person, they are fundamentally a new creature. Paul says that in 2 Corinthians, if any man, if any person be in Christ, he's a new creation, okay? So, believing in Christ, something happens. It's a new creation. Our hearts are changed by the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, in that way, yes, the moment we trust in Christ, we are different. And yet, that difference in us begins to work itself out. Let me give you an example. Um, I hate to say this, but before uh, I was a Christian, and even after, I loved books. Books were important to me. And, um, and also, um, before I was a Christian, I was a great liar. I mean, I was a tremendous liar. I, I'm not kidding. I, had, I would go in with a friend of mine and lie, and when we would walk out, he would go, you know, you're the scariest person I ever met in my life. And I said, why? He goes, I knew you were lying and I believed you. <laughs> and, and I remember after I became a Christian, went into the bookstore, and me and this other guy, and there were only two books left of what we wanted. Okay? And I pulled the books out and I immediately saw that one of them was tore a little bit, like that much on its jacket. Well, for me, that won't work. I love books. So I pulled them both out and I handed him the tore one. And the moment I did it, it was like I wanted to throw up. I mean, it was literally like someone stabbed me in the heart. And it was so like, what on earth? I knew it was wrong. I couldn't stand it. But man, I just, I bucked up again, you know. I love books. He doesn't. I started reasoning. He won't read it anyways, you know. And I make it back finally to my dorm room, and I am so miserable. We didn't have cell phones in that day. We like send smoke signals and things. <laughs> but I had, to, I had to get on the phone and call him and say, look, I am so sorry. I gave you a book I knew that was tore a little bit because I love books. And he goes, you are out of your mind. I don't care. I won't even read it. I said, doesn't matter. I'm coming over right now and we're trading books. Why did that happen? New creature. Something happened. Did I, did I sin as a Christian? Yes, I did. I put myself first, didn't I? Did I fight against it even when I knew it was wrong? Yes, I did. Could I hold out? No. Eventually, I had to fix it. Do you see? It's the same way today. I'm 57 years old and I have a three-year-old daughter. Oh my gosh, call me Abraham. And, <laughs> but I have, I have my children and there's so many times that I will have to go to them, like my 12-year-old my daughter and say, hey, Rowan, um, while ago in the kitchen, I was so impatient with you. And I'm so sorry. And she, she'll always say, oh, that's all right, Dad. And I go, no, you remember what I taught you. It's not all right. You, you, you have to forgive me. And to, to have your 12-year-old daughter or your 8-year-old daughter or son say, okay, Dad, it's true. You were impatient with me, but I forgive you. And they know that in the Greek it means I release you. You're free. I have nothing against you. You see, it's, it's not that we're perfect. It's not that we no longer have some sort of a relationship with sin. It just means that our relationship with sin has changed. Before I was a Christian, it was like we walked arm in arm. I, not only did I love to sin, I boasted about it. I can out sin you. But then, it's not that we were totally separated. But it's like sin's going that way now and I'm going this way. And that's what John's trying to get at them here. He goes, look, these people who are telling you that, yeah, you can know God and love God and, and just live in evil, 
in darkness, they're lying to you. God is making a new creation. He's making new creatures. Okay? Now, so he says, now l let's do a little bit of, of Greek because it'll be helpful. Is there a clock around here? Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, let's just look at a little, it's kind of interesting. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now the word walk there is uh, peripateo. Peri, the, the prefix peri, means around, to walk around, peripateo. So what he's talking about, you know how some people, you know, like, like their religion or whatever, it's like, hey, we're in the church building, don't say that. You know, that type of thing. You can say it outside, but don't say it here. All right? What John's saying, if, if we say we know him and yet we walk around in darkness, that means our, our entire style of life is just like everywhere we walk, we're walking in darkness. Okay? We're just doing things that contradict what God's told us about himself, that contradict what God's told us about his will. When we do that, when we walk that way in all kinds of areas in our life, because we're lying when we say we're Christians. And if we find ourselves doing that, we need to sit there and go like this. Am I really a Christian? Now, again, let me get this into, into your head. I know your head is so full of homework and everything. You've got to get this. True Christians are not sinless. As a matter of fact, one of the evidences that you're actually a Christian is that you struggle with sin. You struggle against it, okay? And there will be victory, but there will also be defeats, okay? Now, he says this, But if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. What does it mean to walk in darkness? It is to walk in a way that contradicts everything God told us about Himself and everything He told us, revealed to us, about His will. To walk in the light is just the opposite. To walk in a way that is inclined toward what God has said about Himself. We're, we're seeking to imitate God and what God has revealed about Himself in commandments and wisdoms and precepts. We study the Scriptures because we want to know how to walk, how to live, okay? And that's what he's getting at. He says now, so basically one of the greatest evidences that you're a Christian is that you're seeking to understand who God is from the Scriptures. You're seeking to understand God's will from the Scriptures. And you're seeking to conform your life to that, okay? Now, you say, well, Paul, sometimes I find myself doing that, but sometimes, too, I'm really apathetic, and sometimes I really struggle. Am I not a Christian? Well, no, because I find myself in the same boat sometimes, sometimes full of zeal and just ready to go and fight against sin and sometimes too apathetic. But when I am apathetic, I know I'm apathetic. And I can't stay there. And, and fortunately, I'm surrounded by a bunch of uh, just people who love me and love the Lord. And that's why Christianity is not a lone, wo lone wolf religion. You know, we need to encourage one another. We need to uh, bless one another. We also need to tell one another, hey, you're wrong. Or, hey, you're slipping. Or, hey, let's get back in the game. How can I help you? You see? And so what we're talking about here again is not perfection, but we're talking about if I were to put an, a person here who claims to be just a total unbeliever, OK, and their style of life and everything, and then I put you right beside them and you claim to be a Christian, but you look just like them all the time, there's a problem. Do you see the problem? I mean, there's a problem. That at least you're going to have to say to yourself, I really need to look at Scripture. I really need to talk to somebody because there's no change. There's no change that's happened, it seems. There's no change going on. 
I, I call myself a Christian because I was raised in church, but, you know, I, I, I'm not any different ever. Then, yeah, you need, to, you need to be looking at some things. Or if you're sitting there, and I've met so many students, not only on this campus, but in many campuses, where they'll come and talk to me and go, oh, I'm a Christian. And I go, really? And they go, yeah, yeah, I was, I was raised in church. Well, how long have you been a Christian? I've been a Christian all my life. And uh, what, what does that mean? Well, well, man, I go to church and I try to do my best. That's not a Christian. That's not a Christian at all. That's a person who's got a little bit of bad religion. A Christian is someone who says, I'm a Christian. Well, why? Because I've recognized that church going and baptism and all the good things I try to do well, God said in Isaiah, it's about like filthy rags. I'm a Christian because I realized that Christ lived the life I couldn't live. He died my death in my place, and I trust in him. Well, what other hope do you have? I have no other hope. Well, what about your works? I want to do good things, but they're not my hope. If God judged me for my best works, there would be no hope. I'm a Christian because I am trusting in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. There's only one hero in this story, students. And it's none of us or anyone else who's ever been a follower of Christ. Christ is the only hero. Okay? And as I heard one old preacher say one time, you won't get to heaven with one shred of self-righteousness on your back. And what he means is, those who go to heaven are those who've realized, I contribute nothing here. In this thing of salvation... He's the actor. I'm passive. He has acted upon me. He died for me. He lived for me. He rose again for me. I'm trusting in him. And then someone may say to you, yeah, but since you did that, you've really changed. And, and it seems like, you know, you're a different person. Well, praise God that I've changed and I'm a different person. But none of that contributes to my salvation. He did it all. You see, one, let me put it this way. 100% him. Zero percent all of the rest of us. He did it all. That's why salvation is by grace. You see that? It's grace. So when we talk about a Christian's going to live a different life, he lives a different life, kind of like a duck. That wasn't a good... <laughs> what do I mean? You ever heard this song? You know, if it walks like a duck, if it... What do ducks do? Quacks like a duck and flies like a duck. If I say talk, if it talks like a duck, that wouldn't really work. But if you, if you hear d ducks talking, you need, a, you need counseling. <laughs> but if it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, by walking like a duck and quacking like a duck, that didn't make it a duck. It was a duck. And because it was a duck, it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, okay? Are you following me? It's the same way. If, if someone is acting and living as a Christian, that's not what makes them a Christian. What makes them a Christian is trusting in Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in them, 100% God. And the fact that they may be changing and growing is the result of what God has done in His Son. Let me give you an illustration that a friend of mine uses uh, a lot. He's a brilliant guy. Um, l l let's look at it this way. Let's say that I have, that all of you are in class with me, and it's a physics class, and it's the worst, most difficult weeder class in physics possible. I mean, you know, it's, it's horrific, okay? So you're all coming to my class, and you're scared to death because it's your senior year. You've got to do good in this class in order to graduate, okay? Let's say half of you are math students and the other, who hate physics and the rest of you are physics majors and you love physics, okay? So I get up and I, I say, I do this. I surprise you all. I say, if you've made it this far to my class, it means that you're good students, that you've studied hard in mathematics and physics, and this is your last semester. But if you've made it this far, you're diligent and worthy. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give all of you an A. Here at the very first day of class, I'm giving all of you an A. 
Now let's just enjoy the material. Okay? Wouldn't that be great? Well, let's say, remember, 50% of you are math students who hate physics, and the other 50% are physics majors who love physics. Okay? So when you hear that as a class, all the math students go, who hate physics, they go, you mean we got an A? Regardless of what we do, we got an A? And they stand up, and they, as they walk out the door, they drop the physics book in the door and walk out because they hate physics. But the physics students go like this, who love physics. You mean we got an A? I mean, we have an A. And, and we just get to study this, like, for fun? We can enjoy it, and we can look at it, and we can try to understand it, and we can do all this and without any pressure whatsoever, because we got an A. And the professor goes, yes, and they go, oh, man, this is fantastic. That's the difference between a religious person and a Christian. You tell a religious person who's not truly a Christian, Jesus did it all. It's not your works. It's what Christ did on Calvary. And they'll go, fantastic. Throw the Bible in the trash can, walk out, let's go party. <coughs> let's commit every sort of immorality. Let's uh, lie and cheat and let's go after the world. Not care about our fellow man or God. Because we got an A. We're getting into heaven. But the Christian whose heart has changed, who has truly believed in Christ, they go, hold it. You mean I get to know who God is. I get to have fellowship with God. I get to read this book. I get, I get to change. And yet, all the pressure's off that Christ did it all. So now, I, like, I mean, I can try to be like Christ and not fear failure. I can try to do these things, but when I look in the mirror and see I fail, I won't get afraid because he did it all. Is that what? And they go, oh, this is wonderful. You see the difference? That's what's going on here. Okay. Now, next week we're going to talk about confession of sin. And we're going to see that it's actually quite uh, liberating. It's quite wonderful. And it's one of the true marks of being a Christian. You know, on television and media, a lot of times they always try to portray Christians as these self-righteous people. Okay? I always thought that was kind of funny. Of course, there's in America, you know, so many people call themselves Christians who are not. Because if you're self-righteous, Christianity doesn't, doesn't work that way. But if you really look at it with a clear view, you see this. The Christian is the one person that's not self-righteous because he is seeing his sin, seeing her sin, seeing their lack of ability to earn their own salvation and trusting in someone else. And as they live their life, they're recognizing that they do sin and they're confessing it to God and maybe even to others when they sin against someone else and uh, they find they're constantly in need of grace. What is grace? Just, I'll give you the most basic definition. God's unmerited favor. Favor you did not earn. Favor you don't have to earn because Christ earned it with His perfect life and perfect death. Do you see that? It's unmerited favor. And far more than that. That's the most basic definition. So you say, wow, this kind of interests me. I'm, I want to know, you know how to live as a Christian. Just stop. First of all, ask yourself, are you a Christian? Because I'm not a Christian because I know a little bit more about how to live as a Christian. And I'm not a Christian because I've obeyed some commands. I'm a Christian for the same reason the thief was, for the same reason the 
most hardened criminal who believes in Christ is a Christian. I'm a Christian because 2,000 years ago, the Son of God died in my place. That's my only boast. I have no other boast. You see that? That's a Christian. No other hope, no other boast, nothing. Christ died for sinners. That's what gives me peace. And that's me. All right? All right, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for these students. And I pray that you would bless them and, and strengthen them. And Lord, show them your son and his goodness and his complete and perfect work on Calvary. Father, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless and thank you.